Welcome and good morning, everyone. As you're coming in, uh, I'll be your host for today's morning talk with Dr. David Clifton on the call already. While people are trickling in, we'd love to know uh, what specialty you're from and where you're geographically located. Uh, I'm in Vancouver, Dr. Clifton is in Oxford, so we're already international. But yeah, just let us know in the chat where you're from and what specialty you're in. I always feel like I need some uh, intro music, you know, elevator music to kill the time. The last lecture I gave, I actually started outside and then charged into the lecture theater while music was playing. So oh, bro. <laughs> we're, we're not doing that today, though. It's a bit, it's a bit dark in England for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah. Oh, I see anatomic pathology there. I've got a lot of slides on anatomic pathology. Actually, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Neurology. I like it. Obs Gein, brilliant. Pathology, clinical informatics, and clinical trials. A good variety for you, Dr. Clifton. Pediatrics and data science. I like it. One more minute and we'll just get started then, folks. I'll pass it over to Dr. Clifton and I'll stop talking. Psychology and data science. Maybe I should have a bingo board and we'll uh, check off. We can hit all the different specialties of medicine next time. Keen pathology, brilliant. That's a great Scrabble word. <laughs> Trauma and acute care surgery. Yeah, fairly diverse here. All right, it's 9.03, so let's get going. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday morning. My name is Rohit Singla. I'm an MD PhD trainee, uh, and I'm delighted to be the host for today's talk. Uh, today, we will be hearing from Dr. David Clifton on non imaging applications of AI. Before I get started and introduce Dr. Clifton, I do just want to recognize our sponsor for this talk that is the UBC Data Science and Health Research Cluster, or DASH, led by Dr. Spalepo and saying UBC DASH is working to harmonize health data access in BC. DASH envisions the development of a harmonized data ecosystem that can accommodate multimodal and multidimensional data. Their members are applying data science to health research to improve diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases. This morning, Dr. David Clifton joins us from the University of Oxford, uh, where he is a professor of clinical machine learning in engineering science and an OCC fellow in AI and machine learning at Rubin College, Oxford. He's a research fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, visiting chair in AI for healthcare at the University of Manchester, and a fellow of the Fudan University of China. His research focuses on the development of machine learning for the tracking of health of complex systems. His previous research resulted in patented systems for jet engine health monitoring, since 2008, he has focused mostly on the development of AI-based methods for healthcare. I'll take it, I'll stop sharing my screen and let you take over, Dr. Clifton. Thank you very much, Rohit. Great pleasure to, to be with you all today. Let's uh, quickly share the screen, make sure we've got the right slides come up. Can you see some slides? Uh, yes, I can. Fantastic, that's great. I'll just take it away. One of those windows. Brilliant, and Rohit, uh, if you wouldn't mind just perhaps giving me a five minute warning near the end. 
Um, and see that we can leave some time for questions as you see. Yeah, would you like an interruption or a message? In the yeah, chat? sure, absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I probably can't see the chat given the uh, layout of the screen. So all right, thank you. sounds great. Thanks very much. Great pleasure to talk to you all. And obviously, it's I think it's 9 a.m. for you. So grab a stiff coffee and uh, we'll have a, a little gentle introduction to your Tuesday morning. Obviously, for me, it's the other end of the day. I've just come from picking up my kids at school. Um, unusual title, Advances in Non-Imaging AI. And simply that's because there's obviously a lot of imaging AI around and it's got its own language and it's got its own data sets and its own, its own problems, uh, particularly medical imaging. And this is not that. Um, so the stuff I do is almost everything else. Um, omics, sensors, electronic health records. If it's not an image, we're, we're probably doing. So I'll give you a, a, an overview of some stuff that's, that I think is cool. And um, it's great to have a conversation with you guys afterwards. Okay, now, can you see a change of slides? That's sort of the other question to ask. Yes, you are good. Excellent, excellent. So uh, the, uh, the thrust of our work is in, in the lab at Oxford is very much um, not <laughs> the contents of this slide. Actually, I drew this slide when I was at NeurIPS in Vancouver in 2019. That was probably the last time I traveled, in fact. Um, and obviously the, the, the joke in this slide is that uh, people think might think that AI is there to replace medics and to replace doctors. And, and clearly everyone on this call knows that that's not gonna happen anytime soon. And um, the name of the game for us is very definitely creating things that help medics, things that bring their attention to the right place at the right time, and doing what it is that AI does best, machine learning does best, which is um, surveillance, by which I mean, in the non-spooky sense, seeing all the patient data all of the time in the hospital, um, sometimes in the home as well, um, perhaps a bit of a hospital focus to talk today, simply because there's so much rich data. Um, it's heterogeneous, it's massively multivariate. It comes from all different kinds of sensors and modalities, and it's noisy and it's artifactual. And that's why we love it. Um, and I love it very much because it's, it's almost perfectly tailor-made for machine learning in the sense that you, you, you can get quite a long way with your logistic regressor or your corpse proportional hazards model, but by the time the data get very big and very multimodal and multivariate, you, you end up very quickly in machine learning territory. So I'm here uh, in the green building at Oxford and uh, on the floor above me, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine was made, a little bit on that later. Um, the kind of stuff that we do is, is obviously very much machine learning for healthcare. Uh, so I'm there. Um, I've also, just, just for context, so you know, uh, the sort of the name of the game and the kind of stuff that we're up to more generally, just in context, I've got a lab just outside Shanghai in the Oxford University Research Center uh, in Suzhou. So if any of you have got Chinese backgrounds or happen to find yourself in Suzhou, which is a beautiful place, by the way, um, please do come and drop in. And uh, that, that place there gives us a really good opportunity to collaborate with hospitals in Wuhan, uh, hospitals in Shanghai, et cetera, um, and doing the same thing as we do in Oxford, but in China. And um, there's obviously uh, one of the, the backbones of the kind of work that we do is compute. So there are walk-in computers where you can go and dry your hair very effectively, um, if, you, <laughs> if you say well. Um, so you, you definitely need very, very large computing to do the kind of stuff that we'll, we'll see today. Um, perhaps of interest uh, to, to some of you as well, um, we have a, a good proportion of our work is for low and middle income countries. We're very fortunate to have the Wellcome Trust fund us with the first flagship center that they set up um, between us and our, our colleagues in um, the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit, which is in Ho Chi Minh City. It is in a uh, the, the number one hospital there for infectious disease. And if uh, any of you have been watching the headlines, um, you will know that uh, Vietnam had a very good pandemic, pretty much, a very low number of cases because they're very um, quick to, to control it. But right now it's a real problem. Um, and the hospital is literally full of COVID-19 patients. So there's lots of um, data acquisition from wearable sensors and other things going on in that hospital to collect uh, patient data from, from those suffering from COVID-19. And the goal here is to, to do more with less uh, which is to say not every patient there is connected to a Philips Careview monitor, for example. So can we put in place um, lower cost sensors and make them suitable for clinical practice with some, uh, some machine learning? And uh, just announced recently, um, again, you can see there's a bit of a, 
a theme to the to the centers out there. This one is in Hong Kong, and this center was funded by the Hong Kong government um, to do cardiovascular engineering. So if anyone's got interest in cardiovascular, I'm happy to take some questions there as well. So that's very definitely wearables for CVD, cardiovascular diseases, strokes, things like that. Okay, so um, before we get into the techie bit, I thought I'd just start at the end and show you some of the things that that sort of motivate this work, if you will. And the motivation is really to get into hospitals and to help people. You know, we like our papers, go to publish or perish, but the real, really the name of the game, as I was saying, uh, as I was saying earlier, is to put stuff into hospitals to, to try and make a difference. It started, as, as Rohit mentioned, with jet engines, very well-behaved patients uh, in the top left. That's where my defil was. So if you've flown on the Airbus A380 or the Boeing 787, if you can remember what flying's like, uh, you've got my PhD sitting on top of the engine monitoring the health of that thing and making predictions about its health. Um, and as we mentioned, I then started doing healthcare in about 2008, I'm terribly old, and um, produced these, this, a series of things. Um, OBS Medical uh, was at the, the, the top two here, spin-out companies. OBS Medical um, it, it rolled out the, the world's first and for a very long time only FDA approved patient monitor with machine learning in it, which was quite exciting. Um, and OxyHealth um, looks at the, the, the technology there is actually this camera you can see a neonatal intensive, intensive care unit patient here, and the, the camera is tracking the vital signs remotely. And that's now in uh, the majority of mental health trusts um, in the UK for, for tracking uh, the health of mental health patients. Perhaps a little bit more differently in the bottom row. Um, Biobeats is a company which was bought during the pandemic actually by Huma, H-U-M-A, um, where, where wearables are used to track the stress and the men and, the, and I should say the mental health, but mainly the stress component of one's mental health uh, using wearables. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the other side of the coin. It's about wellness rather than uh, sickness. And the bottom right, a uh, company which we floated on the UK Stock Exchange, went public in 2018 uh, to commercialise some of the, the um, medical technologies that are coming out of our labs at Sensine Health. So it's a really, you know, I, I, I like to start there just to, to motivate, say, this, you know, the, the kind of things we want to tackle, the kind of technologies we're going to talk about today are driven by medics coming up to us and saying, hey, I've got these data sets, I've got these problems, and I suspect you might be able to help. You know, that's the, that's the conversation we have pretty regularly with, with, with various medics um, across Oxford and elsewhere. Um, so hope, yeah, I just wanted to motivate that. Hopefully that'll ring a few bells with some of you. Um, just to just to say that yeah all, all of these projects are clinically driven. Okay, so I, there's a bit of a pandemic theme for this talk, um, in the sense that uh, obviously it's on everybody's minds. We're looking at Omicron now, and um, we're worrying about new variants. And and in the UK, I'm sure everywhere we're worrying about um, can you know can hospitals cope and what are we going to do about it? Um, as I mentioned in, in my building, uh, we've got uh, Dame Sarah and Sir Andrew Pollard. Um, who put together the, the, the Chadox MCOV-19 uh, vaccine very quickly, uh, which has rolled out to AstraZeneca and now rolled out, I think it's, I think it's um, rolled out most of all the vaccines. And um, we're working with Andrew Pollard um, using UK surveillance data, so all of the primary care data for the UK, which is centralised through the NHS, um, to, uh, to, to make predictions about, is there anything special about breakthrough infections? You've had your two vaccines, if you get COVID-19 after that, is there anything special about you? What's the risk assessment like for people who get um, breakthrough infections and also for nasty outcomes? So you know, things like uh, um, the, the uh, thromboembolisms that, that, that uh, have been mentioned in the past. Um, is there, is there so can we phenotype people who are having those problems too? So very much a work in progress, but I just thought I'd, I'd throw that one up to start with. During the pandemic, we, um, uh, in, the, in the building next to mine, we have now Sir Martin Landry and Sir Peter Warby. There's a lot of knighthoods and damehoods been given out uh, over the last 12 months in the UK. Um, we, we ran the world's largest clinical trial, which is, uh, as you probably know, it's called Recovery. Um, and now we're working with Sir Peter um, on uh, the, the automatic tracking of patients to see if there are medicines that are helping people recover quicker. And we're doing that, um, of course, on our end with, with machine learning. Um, so Peter is, is, is running, I, I wanted to flag this resource for you guys, um, because Peter runs this thing called ISARIC, which has been going since 2011, as you can see on this slide, but it's a massive worldwide data collection activity, and it's completely open source and open. And um, 
Peter, Sir Peter's uh, activities in global health. Uh, he really cares about uh, tropical medicine. And of course, this came into its own uh, during the pandemic when um, it was the, 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 one of the primary means of sharing data, as you can see here, between uh, over 130 com com countries. And right now, that is all done by a heroic team of human beings curating data. But obviously, that's not going to scale uh, for too much longer. If you want to really uh, increase the volume uh, of data that are coming through these kind of networks, can we do it in a semi-automated way by machine learning? So that's the kind of stuff that we're, we're looking at with Peter. Um, so I just thought, I'd, as, a, as a quick case study before we can get we get into you know, the very new stuff, um, I just wanted to just I mean, everybody's sort of been responding, haven't they, very quickly in a sort of a war effort to, to the COVID nineteen pandemic and. Um, Here's a, I thought I'd throw out a, a case study of what machine learning can do for you. So we, uh, it, it, the, the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, so in probably April 20, uh, 2020, um, we sat down with these gentlemen here. So uh, David Ayer and Andrew Sultan, who are superstar clinicians in the Oxford University hospitals, that's me in a silly pink jacket. Um, and uh, we, we decided to, see if we can help out emergency departments by putting in place a test. Now, what did we say at the start? Um, machine learning is really good at just surveilling patient data. And I firmly believe that a good, you know, a very simple thing to do with AI is just to build on the data that you've already got rather than adding to the burden of acquiring new data. Is there something that you can do with the big pile of data that exists already? And this project was about repurposing existing data, by which we mean when patients present to the emergency department, everybody gets a blood test anyway. And blood tests are super trivial. You can get a trainee clinical uh, student to do it. And um, they've been recorded, they've been obviously processed electronically for a very long time. I think our time series go back to the mid 1980s, actually. They've been done, they've been there for quite that, that time. So the goal here is to say from those data, from the bloods and from everything else uh, in the patient record. So we've got histories for a lot of patients as well, recognizing that most patients are elderly. Um, therefore, most patients will have probably some previous admissions. Um, in our in our data acquisition system, in our electronic health record. So what we're saying is, can this can we can we identify whether patients got COVID nineteen? So from routine bloods, um, can we predict COVID positive or negative? Can we make a tool to do that? Why would we do that? Aren't there tests to do that? Well, at the start of the pandemic, it took one to two days to do it, and uh, my my um, consultant in the ED friend uh, um, had to take two days off while he waited for his negative PCR result, which he got eventually. But it was forty eight hours out. When he should have been caring for patients. Um, obviously, it's a bit, it's a lot faster now. Um, I'm told by uh, our consultants in the emergency department, you can get it down to about 12 hours. You can get, you can get your PCR down to about 12 hours, maybe a bit faster. But certainly in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same globally, the emphasis is, in, is on getting people out of the emergency department promptly. And in the UK, you've got a four-hour deadline to do that. So 99% of patients leave at three hours, 59 minutes, because they've got to get out in four hours. So what do you do? You can't wait for your PCR. In the UK, you are actually allowed to use lateral flows, but they've got a very uh, poor false negative rate in the sense that they don't get all of the positive cases. So you can imagine it would be very unpleasant if you sent someone who didn't have COVID-19 into a COVID-19 infection ward, because they're going to get it. It would be even worse if you sent someone who has got COVID-19, you thought they didn't, and you sent them into the lower degree of infection control in the rest of the hospital, because then lots of other people are going to get COVID-19. Um, so uh, lateral flow is, I, don't, I believe it's not used in the US, but it's certainly used in the UK. But uh, most, I, I think a lot of decisions that are being made are based on clinical judgment. Um, so yes, lateral flow has got imperfect sensitivity and an AI test, as we've shown in a couple of publications, can do way better than that. Um, and tests get expensive. I think they're rated at about 30 US dollars each at the moment. Um, and obviously running, a co uh, running an AI algorithm on some data is free. Um, it's not so great. We've all done <laughs> plenty of scraping of our nasal cavities, I'm sure. It's very unpleasant uh, and blood samples are, are painless. Um, and also if you've got a clinician taking the swab as you, you certainly had in the first half of the pandemic, they, they are at risk too. So taking a blood sample is, is zero risk. So it's a great way of being able to, yeah, take, take AI, take existing data 
and make quick predictions, which are essentially free, uh, to help to help decision support. So it's a nice exemplar of the, of the kind of ethos that, that you can um, of, of the work that we do. And we rolled it out into the emergency departments in Oxford. It's been studied in, in also Birmingham hospitals where they had most COVID-19 patients and a couple of other hospital networks. And it's, and it's doing a good job there. So um, we are we're, we're quite excited that these things uh, can, can make a difference. The nice thing about modern machine learning, just getting onto the tech a bit now, I'm going to do it with some cartoons because I love cartoons. Um, this is this is how you know, these tools differ from your favorite Cox proportional hazards model or logistic regressor. If you if you know your, your, your baseline medical statistics, I'm married to a medical statistician, so I say that fondly. Um, the great thing about machine learning is, first of all, you can, as sort of shown here, you can apply um, time series analysis methods to smooth through the data you've got. So you only get data points when clinicians measure them. And that measurement itself might be informative. When you don't have data, it's, it is an informative degree of missingness. So being able to model that in an appropriate way, and I'm showing some wiggly perp, um, gray bounds here to represent our uncertainty. So Gaussian process or neural process models allow us to do that on the time varying data that we acquire in hospitals. They might be hour by hour physiologies. They might be sensor data at 256 Hertz. They might be daily blood tests, whatever it might be. And the results of that, at the same time as fitting that noisy time streams to, 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 to smooth it out and get rid of the artifact, at the same time, you can also concurrently model that in a sequence way. So you can get a recurrent neural network that's, that moves along the sequence and starts to learn the characteristic that you see term. So maybe it's COVID-19 positivity or negativity, for example, in, in our example. The results of that recurrent neural network can then be squished down into a set of informative latent variables. And you do that at the same time as the yellow bit, at the same time as the bits at the bottom. And then from the summary variables that pop out at the end of that, at the same time, you can phenotype the patient. So you can pop them into groups. So you can say COVID-19, you know, class A, class B, and class C, um, as, as we've done in the emergency department. And yeah, at the same time as the clustering, you can make the prediction that you care about. So maybe it's COVID-19 positive or negative. You can also make other predictions such as severity, if they've got COVID-19 or the need for ventilation. Um, and modern machine learning systems benefit from are being asked to do that and auxiliary tasks, things you really don't care about. Um, and that's interesting, isn't it? Why is it beneficial for a machine learning system to be asked to do things you don't necessarily care about as a primary outcome? And the reason for that is a lot of this complex concurrent modeling is just helping the machine see data and understand what, how to process the waveforms. So the more you ask it to do with those, even if you don't necessarily care about the results, um, the better the fit and the better it gets at task one. So if, you, if your goal is to do task one, it's good to help it. To, it's good to have it asked to do task two it can learn any covariance between tasks. So maybe I get better at predicting um, severity if I'm also trying to predict ventilation status and length of stay and so on. Um, and I also get better at doing it if I predict auxiliary tasks as well. And by auxiliary tasks, I mean things you don't necessarily care about, like, for example, trying to predict what your blood pressure is going to be like in 12 hours time. You know, things that might not necessarily match the, uh, the, the application of interest, which will really help the network do a better job at its primary task. And you can see that is a pretty big shift away from classic modeling, be it logistic regression or random forests or whatever, where you get data, pour it into a model training process, get a fixed model, and then you apply that model to your, to your representative data and hope everything works. You can see it's, all, it, it, it's quite a different approach to modeling. So this works in, uh, in, in the Curiel project uh, and uh, the UBC grad, Jenny Yang, who is now our superstar uh, Horizon 2020 fellow uh, in our group um, and, and friends there, Thomas and Exley and others, um, showed you can get a really good performance out of this thing. So it's, uh, it's um, an interesting case study. Another big problem, obviously, in pandemics is the fact that your hospital is going to get rammed full of people with a with a disease and what happens to everybody else? So what happens to the flow through the hospital when everything is getting clogged up? This was such a big deal in the UK. We created 
uh, called Nightingale Hospitals. We created these massive hospitals, but thankfully they were never needed. Uh, so we closed them all down again. Um, but they were vast uh, um, COVID-19, basically intensive care units, um, stuffed full of ventilators and beds that were never used. Um, and perhaps, you know, with no criticism, hindsight is always 2020, isn't it? But can you do better with the resources that you've got? Can you do things predictively rather than reactively? Because if you've been in an emergency department, you probably noticed that a lot of a lot of things that are happening is reactive. A patient's here, and oh, now the patient, I've got to, got to treat the patient because he's been here a while, and now I'm going to order tests because I've looked at him, and oh, I think he's got this problem, so maybe let's start getting the bed ready because he's got to leave the emergency department in half an hour. Um, for us, an AI, and you can probably guess from where I'm going, is really good at prediction. So a patient comes in and he's got a whole load of data and previous histories. And we can say, this patient probably needs this scan. This patient probably needs this bed getting ready. Um, so we can do a lot of this predictively to improve flow. One of the nice things about Oxford MSC hospitals is that we happen to put the uh, data uh, monitoring systems in. So literally every patient in Oxford University Hospitals uses our system, which is called SEND, S-E-N-D, um, to have physiology uh, results entered. So we've got a data set which is uh, over a million patients now. It's absolutely enormous. It's, the, it's about 10 times bigger than the next biggest one in the world. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's just a very helpful thing to do machine learning, machine learning with if you've got a lot of data, of course. So, but with, um, when you've got a million patients worth of data, again, this is a, a sort of a, another point of departure from modern machine learning from traditional machine learning, like random forests or XGBs or, or traditional medical statistics, is that it can become suboptimal to do business as usual, by which I mean get data, train single model for single task, output models, like using model. Um, once you've got a million patients of data, and every one of those patient admissions is a very rich time series yeah. evolving through time of 10, 20, 50 variables, it becomes very hard just to hit go in, in your favorite Python package and to get the model learned. So what I'm doing on this slide is, as I mentioned here, a model to help you build the model. And the thing in this slide, the thing we care about um, is the student network at the bottom. So it might be a, a deeper network with all the bells and whistles that I showed earlier, but it is trying to do something as a primary outcome. And we're going to have a teacher model that helps the student to learn. Um, so in this uh, diagram, so this was published last year in ICML um, by Rashid Oburi, one of our superstars who's just about to get his DPhil. Um, you take the training set and in traditional machine learning or data analysis, you're just going to pass all those data to the student. Uh, and in modern machine learning, you might divide the data up into mini batches and provide all the mini batches in sequence to the neural network and hope it trains and hope it gets there. There's a lot of hope there. Um, whereas if you've got the teacher, as we have here, what the teacher is doing is selecting which spoonful of data to feed to the student next. And so this is a reinforcement learning problem, a little bit like the, the paradigm is used for AlphaGo in the sense that the, the, the action that the teacher is going to take is which spoonful, which batch do I give to the student? The student then uses that data to improve itself, hopefully, and any improvement is the reward signal to the teacher. And so the student starts to learn, and at the same time, the teacher learns to train the student, and they end up getting there together. And by the end of this process, the teacher has learned something fascinating. It's learned what is informative in your data set? Because before that, we didn't know. We've got a million patients, but we don't know anything about the level of informativeness of those patients. Which of those were easy problems? Which of those were hard problems? We didn't know. So the teacher estimates with the hardness of um, feeding batches to the student. And what we learn on the next slide, very quickly, is something fascinating. Uh, just gonna skip over that one. So what we learn, um, just showing you the, the slide on the bottom right. I'm showing you through time as a horizontal axis, and then which spoonful, which mini batch the teacher is providing to the student. And it's at the start, it's a, it starts to learn that the student wants easy things to start with, things that it is estimated to be easy, which makes sense. And then as the student masters those easy tasks, I'm showing you accuracy going up here. This is a seven class classifier. So accuracy of 0.5 isn't bad actually, because uh, chance is about 
it's about 0.12 or, or slightly higher. Um, so it's not 50-50, it's 0. Down here would be chance. So on a seven class classifier, predicting where one should get a bed ready next. Um, this isn't too bad, but you can see accuracy sort of plateaus after a while, after being fed the easy data. And then the machine learns that it needs to be fed hard data after that performance boosts right up to a maximum. And we get up to about 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 on, on various tasks. Um, and if you're just doing bog standard machine learning, um, you're, you're going to get an accuracy of 45%. So that's, you know, a boost of 17% in accuracy is pretty great. So well done to Rafid. And I really like this problem because it shows you that when data sets get big, something's got to change. You can't just, just run by business as normal. Um, so if I may, uh, recognizing speaking out of time, um, I'd like to show you something else that I think is cool about uh, modern um, health AI, um, in the sense that, again, what did we say earlier? We said a, a model is a model it benefits from being able to from being asked to look at multiple tasks, because as we said, a lot of the, the complexity in its network is just helping it to understand the data. So can we show it lots of data, even if the data might be analogous and not immediately relevant in the sense that, for example, I want to predict COVID-19 status, but it turns out that predicting COVID-19 status, it, the performance is boosted if I show it loads of sepsis, tetanus, hand, foot and mouth data. It's a fascinating thing because those are also you know, viral or respiratory conditions. They have a they, they take the same data streams, they've got similar um, effects on the body, they don't necessarily have to have exactly the same outcome. Because as I say, most of the, uh, the network is actually learning how to handle data. So what we're going to do here in that, in that, in that regard is, um, is continual learning. So we're going to take this single network and we're going to ask it to solve a series of problems on different data sets, just as I was describing. And again, that is bonkers with respect to conventional practice, isn't it? Conventional practice is, well, I want to predict COVID-19, but I can't use any data from these other conditions because they're completely unrelated. Um, so th this is, a, again, a fascinating point of departure. Um, the problem is that networks are prone to, as we say here, catastrophic forgetting. So if I take a model and train it on data set one to do thing one, and I go to data set two to, 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 to predict task two, Perhaps unsurprisingly, it starts to forget the previous performance. So, it's, as we say, it's catastrophic forgetting. Um, and what we're what we're going to do to get around this, we're going to train on uh, a data from distribution A. So maybe hospital A or task A. Maybe it's sepsis data. I've got some training data and I've got some labels. I've held out some data to to train that in the normal way. Great. But then I'm going to go on to a different set of data set with a different problem. So maybe I've gone now from sepsis to tetanus. And then I'm going to go on to my third problem. Maybe I'm now going on from tetanus to COVID-19. So we're acquiring, we're, you know, all three of these data sets are distinct and different in the sense that they've got the same types of data. So they've all got heart rates, they've all got blood pressures, et cetera. Um, they've all got the same makeup of variables, but the data sets come from different places and the tasks we're asking the machine to do are different. And what we're going to learn is something quite cool here. So we're going to stuff data into a buffer. So this is called a rehearsal or replay uh, method of training a machine. So using that idea that we described previously of informativeness, we're going to look at our training data set and we're going to say, what was informative there? Which is, I find a fascinating concept because when I talk to medics, they don't know which data are informative. They know which patients are sickest. They know who's got the most acute condition, but they don't know which data were the most informative for building a model, which I think is awesome. So um, what we're going to do here is rank by informativeness, skim off the top N percent, maybe 2% of the data that we think are most important and keep them in a buffer. And then we're going to use them along with our new problem. Uh, we're going to keep the informative data to, to avoid catastrophic forgetting. We're going to go, we're going to do that every time. So we're going to take, as you can see here, we're going to take this informative 2% as well as the new problem, and then we're going to add to that with another informative 2% for task two to do task three. So let's just, uh, as we get to the end, let's just have a little look at that. If we don't use this approach, and we, we've got 12 different tasks here, uh, this is an ECG classification problem. So I'm taking ECG data, and through time, I am asking my machine to do to try and predict pathologies from ECG based on different leads. 
And what that means is, so first of all, I'm going to ask it to do green and it does really fine. And then I'm going to ask it to do red as well as green. And, it, and you can see it does really well on red, but it starts to get worse at green, it's forgetting green. And then I'm going to ask it to do this um, sort of midnight blue color and it's and green are getting really much worse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see by the time you get to the end of this time series and you've asked it to do, what is it, 12 different tasks here, it's got howlingly bad results for quite a lot of them. It's forgotten most of what it's learned, the previous thing. But if you just take this informativeness approach and you, and you change the way the end you look at your data, unsurprisingly, you can drag performance up for all of these tasks and you end up with a machine that is really, really pretty good. So you can see here, you know, peak green accuracy here uh, is actually greater than if you just looked at uh, green on its own to start with, because you've been, you're boosting your performance by asking it to do other tasks, as I say. So just a, just a fascinating idea, I think, by estimating informativeness of data and um, using those in, in a sequence of potentially unrelated tasks, normally you'd have uh, a different machine learning model for every one of these, you can uh, get really decent performance. It's quite quite a sea change in how we think about data analysis. Um, very, very quickly, just, just to finish, just because um, I, I want to show you one project which involves some Canadian data as well. Um, so here we're taking um, tuberculosis data. We've got 100,000 genomes for tuberculosis, and then for every one of those uh, poor unfortunates who have given us a uh, tuberculosis genome from their blood, we've got all of the mutations, and there are millions of them. So it's a sparse binary matrix. And what we're going to do is try and predict drug A or drug B. And we can do that same day now using machine learning. So rather than growing a tuberculosis bug from a patient's bloodstream and trying to work out which drug to give the patient um, using, um, using conventional methods, um, which take 28 days, by which time you may have given a patient an antibiotic to which their bug is resistant. What we can now do, same day, sequence bug from blood, pass it to a machine learning system, predict quite accurately, more accurately than clinicians can uh, otherwise, which uh, antimicrobial this particular tuberculosis in this particular patient's bloodstream is resistant to, and therefore give them the other drug. Um, this is a really exciting project because it's uh, sort of 100,000 genomes for, for tuberculosis, if you will. Um, and for those of you who, who, if there's anyone on the call who knows about genomes, you can also do this with case. So you don't have to do it with the, the mutations. You just go straight to the genome and do exactly the same thing. Okay, I think I will skip on. Um, so machine learning is also really good these days at um, do, uh, uh, solving slightly different other tasks. So we, as I said, which data in the data set are informative? Can you provide confidence in the output? Quite a few machines could do that. Can you cope with noise on the input using, as I showed you earlier, that sort of noisy time series analysis process? And like we pointed out, can we select during training which data we should be using rather than just assuming we can use all the data all the time and get suboptimal results? And the really nice thing about this is that we can get, we can use these systems to label data. Um, so I'm thinking, We've got the uh, UK Biobank, the China Biobank, which we run from uh, my collaborators in the building next door, um, half a million patients each, for example. It's vanishingly impossible to get medics to annotate the data sets of those sizes. So can we use machine learning to annotate and label them? Absolutely. And at the same time, can I show you, as we did earlier, can we, can we learn COVID type A, type B, or type C, Parkinson's type A, type B, or type C? Can we do phenotyping using these methods? And perhaps most importantly for international science, even though we are not allowed to share our data because they're patient confidential, can we create effective generative models that allow us to, so I can give you a model, but I can't give you the patient data. But if the model generates very realistic patient data, which we can prove don't look like the original patients, that's great. I can, I can suddenly start sharing, boosting performance in your data sets by giving you this data generator. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, quick uh, word of thanks um, to, uh, to the sponsors of the, of the lab and the various research projects that are going on there. And of course, the biggest thanks to, to those who did all the hard work, um, including UBC grad, Boston Mike down there, Jenny Yan, uh, and, and many others. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be really happy to take any early morning questions that might have come up.
Thank you so much, Dr. Clifton. Uh, what a phenomenal presentation and a phenomenal, refreshing look at non-imaging applications of AI. Uh, you know, I, I work at ultrasound, and so I'm looking at images all day and every day. Uh, very refreshing to, to hear all this. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Clifton, you're more than welcome to ask them yourself or pop them in the chat, and I can ask them for you. Uh, and I see we already have a question. Go ahead, Martin. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, excellent talk. Um, I had a question, which I apologize is not directly related to uh, your talk, but more just asking you as an expert. Can you comment on the concept of uh, deep Koopman, where you take the nonlinear dynamics and try and use deep learning to linearize it? It seems like a very attractive idea, but I suspect it's uh, more complicated than it looks or sounds. Thank you. No, it's a really nice idea, actually. There's um. I've, if I've got the gist of what you're saying, um, there's there's some really good work by Professor Mihail Lavanda Shah, um, who is obviously at Cambridge, in in doing those kind of uh, analyses, whereby you have a complex deep learning model, and at the same time you're piggybacking on it a descriptive linear model, um, so that by the time you've learned the deep deep learning model, which is complex and gruesome. Um, you've also got an interpretable, let's say, logistic regressor or whatever it might be. Um, and, and often the name of the game isn't um, how good can you make your predictions? You know, in, in engineering, we get super wound up about how good is my AUROC? Is my, is, my, is my receiver operating characteristic uh, slightly better than the previous method? If so, great, good publication. Um, but actually, in a lot of applications, that's not what, what, for example, epidemiologists care about, as I'm sure you know. So in the AstraZeneca vaccine project, it's absolutely not about predicting things. It's about actually, as you say, uh, linearizing and then therefore finding a very explanatory uh, set of risk factors that correspond to um, correspond to the output. So it's, it's using the model to probe for the input in the classic, classical the epidemiological sense. So yeah, there's some really great work on that. I haven't done a lot of it myself, but uh, yeah, it's certainly, okay. certainly an exciting area. Thank you. And then Dr. Clifton, we have a question in the chat. Uh, for the continual learning, do we completely hold out the test data and measure the AUC there? Um, well, there's a whole, uh, it will not come as any surprise to you to learn that there is, there's as many uh, continual learning papers as there are people who care to look at it. Um, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, think there's, I think at the last survey I had yesterday, it was about 1,500 papers of which I want to get this right. Fifteen were with healthcare data. Already, that's not many. And of those fifteen, three were in non-imaging. So twelve were mm. to do with medical images because that's super popular. Um, but very, very little is done in non-imaging, particularly in healthcare. Um, and but but that, you know, there, there is a every permutation you can think of. So. Um, Often what you would like to do is hold, you can certainly hold out your test data, but hold out your test data perhaps, it depends on, on, on the evaluation, but if the goal is to get best task five performance, sure, surely that's the one that you care about. Um, what I was showing you in that ECG example was if you care about average best performance. So if, if I have to bring all of them up, all of those, all of those tasks up, um, that is benefited by continual learning as well, because in this problem, there's a lot of correlation between tasks. So um, no, no quick answer to that one, but um, yeah, often we care about doing a whole bunch of things at once, like I was saying, like predicting COVID-19, predicting severity, predicting the need for ventilation, predicting length of stay. So you would, your performance metric would probably want to take into account all of those, if I've answered your question. And then in, potentially related to that, uh, do AI methods work when patients change on different time scales, or is time course pre-processing methods needed to provide input data for the AI? So the question about good time. Good question. Yeah. Um, I suppose a good example, if I, if I get the gist of the question, I suppose, a, I suppose one example there is a deterioration might happen quickly or slowly um, it, within a hospital stay, for example. And your machine, if you've got sufficient data, your machine would learn the differences between those because they've probably got different physiological um, causes and perhaps consequences. You know, a bleed will cause you to crash very quickly, um, whereas it may be a slower deterioration with homeostasis, your body trying to fix itself will cause a slower deterioration in others. So you certainly see um, different 
deterioration timescales that your machine will have to cope with. So you hope that your training set is sufficiently rich to give your machine exposure to those. The data sets themselves might be over different length scales. So in a hospital, you're getting, as we say, daily bloods, hourly physiology, for example. But you take the same, let's, let, let's take one example. We, we've, we've got tools that predict atrial fibrillation in hospital, undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. And you can also do that in primary care. From your, from your family doctor, from your GP, you can also predict undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. But obviously you don't go to the GP every hour uh, and, or, and have daily blood to the GP there. The timescales are much longer. So you might have 10, 20 years worth of data, but you're getting a data point every six months, 12 months, whatever it might be. So um, on that extremity, I, I must say personally, I haven't seen a model go for a primary care over decades to hospital over hours and so on. There are good examples of fusion between the two. So I had one student um, who's now at Apple and she was, she was doing, she was doing both things. She was looking at predicting IBD, uh, so um, inflammatory bowel disease, a, new, new, um, a particular immune disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. She cared about predicting flare-ups of this nasty condition in hospital, but it was informed by non-hospital data, which were varying potentially, as we're saying, with bloods back to the 1980s. So there you can take in, there, there are models that take into account these really different timescales. It's a really exciting problem, um, but you do have to engineer for it. I mean, you have to, you have to it's, it's not like there's a, a silver bullet in these things. You do have to build that in and recognize that it exists. Wonderful, thank you. And then perhaps if I may ask a question about the translational side. Yeah, you, I mean, you opened up with uh, your great work in spinning out and getting your technology to hospitals. What's that pathway like for you in terms of the non-imaging side of AI? Uh, is it particularly difficult? Do you think there are new challenges there? What, what, could you comment? Yeah, it's getting easier. It's really uh, getting quite slick in some cases. I mean, there's always, there's always problems, but um, it is getting easier. So. Um, most universities worldwide really understand this as well. You know, it's nothing parochial about it, I guess. Um, but we're very fortunate. The university will patent quite a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, those those patents might get licensed to industry. Um, so the university is very good at has a tech transfer office that's very good at linking them up to to, to people who might want to license them, or, or alternatively bundling them up. Um, and making a spin-out company. And we're very fortunate, we have a very large internal venture capitalist fund, which is uh, Oxford Science Enterprises, to, uh, I think it's about 1.2 billion, I think, to, to, um, to, to sort of give seed capital to science uh, projects that are coming out of the university and to get them going. But I guess the, the, the secret source there, as well as like the infrastructure just to back it and make it work, is the fact that you want to work with a tame hospital. And I saw there's some people on the call here who you know, work at Vancouver hospitals. Um, that, that's really the name of the game for us. So we're right next to Oxford University hospitals and the people that we collaborate with there are often professors of medicine who are directly incentivized to do research. That is a big deal because just turning up and hoping that a busy medic can, can work with you may or may not work, um, but professors of medicine certainly do want to work with you and publish. Um, and then getting, I guess the critical bit is the hospital can take the risk in the UK to let you put interventions into their hospital. So Oxford University Hospitals is really good at saying, it, we apply to them, we get ethics, we get approval from the hospital, and then we are permitted to put devices into the hospital. So that curial tool I showed you for COVID-19 is in the emergency department, um, but you don't have to do an FDA approval or anything you know, egregious. Um, you can then, you can know, find peer you can do peer-to-peer -peer with the other networks or hospitals like show you to build the evidence base and i think we've got that tool about as far as you can get it you put it into a, a hospital yourself you can share it with two or three other networks build the evidence base and you get your couple of lancet papers or whatever it might be depending on how ambitious your, your clinicians are and then then it's over to someone else you know to do the scale up because that's definitely not something you want universities doing Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, pathway commentary. I, I appreciate that. Uh, we have another question regarding uh, informativeness of features. Is there a qualitative, qualitative difference in informative features that are based on data versus missingness, or are they treated as the same? 
Good question. Um, so I think importantly here, I'd make the distinction between informativeness of features and informativeness of data. So it, the informativeness of features is pretty well understood in the sense that the, the field of feature selection and dimensionality reduction is, is quite, you can do that in traditional machine learning quite nicely. Um, so if I've got a hundred variables, I might want to choose a subset of those variables which are most informative and that will boost the performance of my machine because my machine, I'm getting rid of lots of noisy variables that don't help. So that's feature selection. You know, can I find a subset of variables that help me? But what I'm talking about here is not that. Let's suppose you take 100 variables, but you've got a million patients. The question here in informativeness that I'm talking about is really, can you rank those million patients with each of which has got 100 variables into informativeness? So was Mr. Smith with the cardiovascular disease more informative for training the model than Mrs. Jones who had diabetes for the same 100 variables? And that's the big deal because otherwise you've got no, you know, you train a logistic regressor, there is literally no way of knowing what, what the level of informativeness is. Same with a, you know, random forest, an XD boost, whatever. You can say which features helped you the most, which variables helped you the most in making that prediction. But what we can't say is which data points, which examples, which patients helped you the most. And why is that cool? Because I get asked quite a lot, how much more data do you need? Do you need another hospital? Do you need another 10 hospitals? Do you need 150 NHS trusts? And the answer is usually, I don't know how much money have you got, but you know, that's a silly answer. Why not make it driven from um, evidence? So you can say, actually, I don't want another hospital's worth of data. I want those 6% of data who are most informative and they happen to have this characteristic. You know, that's intelligent data acquisition. So that's, a, that's a good question. Brilliant. Uh, we'll give people a few seconds to type in any last questions they may or may not have. Otherwise, we'll wrap Just up. Just to quickly there. come in on that last, I can see the chat. Um, NHS jealousy. I mean, the NHS is a lovely thing, and it, as the joke goes, uh, it's the closest that the, the British have to a national religion. That being a joke, because we actually do have a national religion as a state church. <laughs> but um, the NHS is by no means problem free. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, it's a lovely <laughs> organisation and does a lot of things right, but. It is, you know, it's, it's got all the problems that other healthcare systems have got in the sense that you know, every hospital network is, is controlled by its own data governors and you know, going from hospital A to hospital B isn't easy. They've got different equipment providers, data curation methods. It's all different. And it, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stress and pain under the surface. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know people think you know, it's a national health. I know you, the comment there isn't that naive, absolutely. But I, I do bump into a lot of Americans, for example, in the US who think, oh, you've got the NHS, it's just a single payer. You know, it must be great. Uh, centralized data, but sadly, not quite the reality. <laughs> uh, one last question. It looks like, uh, can you summarize how to calculate informativeness? Sure. I mean, there's, a, there's a, again, a gazillion ways to define informativeness. Um, in the ICML paper I showed you before, it was a really quick and simple way. So you've got a cluster of data and um, you, the, 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 the student there, Rashid, was choosing which ones are closest to the centroid of that data. So which data are most like all the other data and less in, le nominally um, more informative and more rare were those data which were on the edge cases. Uh, there are um, other papers that we've done where we've taken a slightly different approach data that are very easy to classify are those which are far away from a decision boundary. So you can imagine your, your data space of perhaps variable one versus variable two, and you draw a line through that. And if you're on one side of the line, you're in class one. If you're on the other side of the line, you're in class two. So that would be a nonlinear classifier and a 2D providing two, two input variables. Um, so if you're far away from that decision boundary, it's very easy. No matter what you, how you perturb those data, you're probably not going to change class. But the data points that are near the boundary, um, those are the ones that are hard to classify because you perturb them a little bit, get a bit of noise on the sensor, whatever it might be, suddenly you're in the other class. So distance away from the decision boundary and looking at perturbations of the data point is how we tend to do it uh, in, in more complex models, if that makes any sense. Wonderful. Well, we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much again, Dr. David Clifton, for joining us from Oxford. 
uh, and spending time with us to talk about your great research. Just a reminder to the audience that we do have another invited lecture series on December 7th at 3 p.m. PST. Uh, so tune in then. But otherwise, thank you all. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. And uh, thanks again, Rohit, for the introduction and uh, for sharing mm -hmm. so well. Of course. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. All right. Cheers. Take care Bye -bye. now.